The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church, new uh, Full Stature Ministries. For those that are outside of the local church, they know us as Full Stature. We traveled for 12 years as Full Stature Ministry. You can make out your offering to Full Stature or Kingdom Life. It's going to come to the same place. So anyway, uh, thank you for coming. And I'm going to give part two because I've been seeing the necessity of what the Lord's been speaking to us. On Tuesday night, there's a corporate voice. Uh, we, we soak in the presence of God for intimacy, but to also to have our spiritual senses exercised to discern, to see, to hear, and to touch in the presence of the Lord. And even though I was a hyperactive kid, everything that I learned that was of value that's in our books and elsewhere, I learned by taking this antsy kid and teaching him to sit still. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't easy. Dennis the Menace rose up on a regular basis, and God said, I said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to train you in the school of the Spirit, but you're going to have to sit still. And it killed me. And he goes, that's what I want. I was trying to kill your flesh, but not annihilate it. I wanted that mind, will, and emotion submitted to the Lordship of the Spirit, because that is the beginning of a relationship. You can't know God apart from intimacy. And I know some men even have trouble as Christians with that word intimacy. It's not sexual, all right? Intimacy is spirit-to-spirit -spirit touch. It's uh, knowing by the Spirit. It's awareness of the Spirit to where you get so perceptive to His nature that you know when you hear a word, a voice in your head, a feeling in the gut, you know if it's got his nature attached to it or not. The devil could quote scripture. I want to know the reality of a relationship with God. And for those that uh, have gotten off track on, well, God said, God said, and I hear a voice and, I, and I said that, to get off track, I'll tell you what, I want to challenge you. Start learning to live by your conscience. Your conscience is the voice of the Spirit. And if you're a Bible-based Christian, you should be listening to the gut. Red light, green light, yellow light would be a lot safer than voices. There's the voice of the world, there's the voice of the flesh, there's the voice of the devil, and we've taught on that and everything. But I want to tell you something, to really walk the Christian walk, you've got to learn to listen to your gut. The voice of your spirit is conscience, and conscience is, is something that if you've got a red light, don't do it. Don't say it. Come on. You ever start to say something and then the gut goes, mm, listen to that. That little buzzer knows what it's talking about. All right. Now, anyway, I want to do part two on spiritual fathering and mentoring. And uh, I had a friend that came from Africa, Aiken, and he said that uh, when he left, he asked his pastor, uh, and I shared this in the part one, he says, uh, where should I go to church? And he goes, don't. Don't, don't find a church. Find a spiritual father. And a spiritual father is not somebody to dominate you. It's the one that's going to unpack the gold that's in you. All right? So it's not about... Uh, and even in the beginning when the Gentiles were getting born again, I'm talking first century, before there was a New Testament, you had 12 apostles of Jesus. They had to teach Gentiles who were clueless. They didn't have an Old Testament. And they had to teach them from the Old Testament scriptures, but they also taught them from the Didache, which we've got a book on that, on the ancient blueprint. And the Didache was an outline of how to teach these Gentiles who have no foundation whatsoever. They don't have Ten Commandments. How do we teach them uh, what we heard with our own ears Jesus say? Remember, first hundred years before there was a New Testament complete. What Jesus, we actually heard him say, and what the Old Testament says as far as moral and uh, uh, word of God. And they would say, this is from the Mishnah, actually, this is a rabbi's taught this even. Uh, they would say, 
a man can bring you into this world, but it's your mentor or a spiritual father that can teach you how to live in this world and the world to come. So when you think about it, that's not demeaning to a natural father. Uh, hopefully, if they're spiritual fathers, uh, they've, they've uh, qualified. But nevertheless, regardless of how good a pastor is, a spiritual father, a natural father as a Christian, no matter how good they are, your identity, and this is what we're going to get to today, we're going to minister to this, and I feel there's a lot of people watching that are going to need this. They need, probably need to take notes today because it's going to be any need, any unmet need in you that's residual that you did not get growing up you do have a substitute. There's no vacuum within you. In other words, if you did not meet a legitimate need, legitimate need, approval, worth, value, security, those are legitimate needs. If you did not meet those needs righteously, you found a substitute to meet that need. And I want to see people grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and move on into maturity. And that's going to require you recognizing, and we're going to get into just how you do that. But first of all, I want to explain the difference between mothering and fathering because it's very popular now for even churches to have a more mothering attitude. And the mothering attitude is absolutely essential. But you cannot father, as a matter of fact, until the mothering aspect is, is getting in. So uh, let me start with, uh, with the scriptures. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15, it says, for though you might have 10,000 instructors, yet you do not have many fathers. And then as maturity goes, Paul says in Galatians 4.19, my little children for whom I labor in birth again, that Christ be formed in you. So there's a, a maturation is the heart of a father. He wants you to mature in character. He wants you to grow up. It's not just about gifts. It's about growing up into maturity. And uh, we, we recognize that without mothering in place, uh, the child really will not learn. Isn't that something? In other words, they need the love and the care and the tenderness that comes natural to a mother, even an unsaved mother. The most beautiful picture we have of, apart from Jesus, is a mother's love for a baby. And even the pagans and evil people love their children like that, can. Now, a mothering uh, example is like, uh, we, we've said this before, but it's like on Monday morning, they get the kids out of bed, they feed them a nutritious breakfast, <laughs> and get them all, uh, books, homework together, and get everybody off to school on time. Uh, mothers provide an atmosphere of love, safety, and security. And quite frankly, if that need wasn't met, uh, righteously, you have found a substitute for that. And on a scale of 1 to 10, what was it like being raised with mother? And we've had people on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being bad, showing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'll tell you what, if that was your experience as far as safety and security with a mother, you're going to need ministry on how to get that reparented by Jesus. And we're in a reparenting cycle because we have a fatherless generation for the most part. And quite frankly, mothering is far more appealing than fathering. Mothering is making you feel safe and secure, and that's an absolute necessity, or you're not going any farther. But fathering is unpacking the potential, the uniqueness of every child. And that's child of God as well as your natural children. They all have different gifts and talents. You don't make them like you. You don't live your life through them. That's dysfunction on your part. What you do is you identify their uniqueness, and you pull that gold out. Same thing in a church. I don't make everybody an evangelist. I don't make everybody, uh, uh, well, yeah, I do. I make a, Everybody needs to be mature or don't come here. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> See, you need a mothering church that goes, oh, that's okay. You can stay a baby forever. It's comfortable in the womb. You don't do anything. And there's even a level of growth in the womb, but it's no effort on your part. But then you get born. Oh, that's when life starts to happen. I'll tell you what, after you're born, all of a sudden now you've got to face the realities of, guess what? Life's not fair. Everybody's not going to love you. That was a shock to me because I thought I loved Jesus. Jesus loved me. I thought everybody loved me. It only took maybe 
one church service before I realized that's not true. Every, <laughs> everybody's not going to love me, but anyway. So without mothering in place, the child will not learn. It takes a mothering approach, and this can be by a male or a female, but it takes that mothering approach because it's God that's, that's doing the, that needs to be doing the work. And we create an environment of fe feeling uh, safe and secure as a child. But after mothering reaches high tide, it still requires fathering, whether by a male or female, to create the pressure that unpacks the potential within the child. And our church is full stature oriented. In other words, grow up. Uh, if you insist on being a child, or I already dealt with everything, everything was covered by the cross. Yes, it was. How much of it did you apply? Um, we have team ministry online school that walks you through the process from your initial encounter with Jesus to the subsequent process, the way the Holy Spirit works. So we've got team online school. We've got the simple prayer named after Jennifer, who was considered too emotionally damaged for me to marry her, according to her mentor. And her mentor was a brilliant lady, Bible school president, missionary, school psychologist, and she said, oh, I know you're serious, but you're a pastor, and you need to know that uh, this woman here, she's very, in, very intelligent, but she's too emotionally damaged to be involved in ministry with you. What are you going to do? And I'm going, I was a baby Christian seeing people from mental health get better. So, you know, you're talking to the wrong person. She was talking out of her own experience and theology of failure <laughs> and kind of, she said, if you're not pretty well developed when you get saved, you only go so far. That was her bottom line, really. Kind of sad, huh? But anyway, uh, after that mothering, we have the 60-day challenge, which in less than 60 days, Jennifer was dramatically transformed, even to the point where that woman said, wow. And what happened to you? We have the peace challenge, which is another one. Um, it may not be instant. But the peace challenge is to let the peace of God rule. He will guard your heart from the toxic emotions and junk that comes from other people. As a matter of fact, I'm, uh, uh, the word of the Lord to Debbie right now, I just want to give you a prophetic word that God says that there's an anointing on you right now that when you go up north, you're going, you're going to see that you're going to be the peacemaker. Without effort, it's going to be what you carry with you is going to be the calming effect in people's lives. And so uh, we have the peace challenge. Then we also have self-deliverance. I can remember Bob Jones saying that many years ago, what the church needs is self-deliverance. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean self is doing the delivering. <laughs> I did have somebody comment on that one. No, self-deliverance means you go to the Jesus within, the deliverer lives within you. You take personal responsibility to learn how to yield your will and get set free. Yes, you can use other people, but you've got the tools, and they're ready at hand. According to the message, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In the message translation, it says, you have these God tools, and they're in you, and they're ready, and they're available. So you can clear the gr ground of philosophies, arguments, and anything that needs to get out of the way. But I'll tell you what, uh, pressure is a boot camp situation. And you come here, it's going to be like a boot camp. You read any of our books, it's going to be boot camp. And the key when we traveled is we saw that one of the weakest areas in the church was effort. If you can't just go like this to me and I'm better, I'm not interested. Because, see, that would require effort on my part. And that's very common. So what we did when we traveled, we go... The need was so great, we'd go church to church. Said, How do we handle all these people, especially on a one-on-one? -on -one? How do we do it? And what we found out is we gave simple, listen to that word, simple homework. And you'd be shocked at how many people couldn't do their homework. I don't know if the cat ate it or they lost it or they forgot or what, what have you. But if you won't do simple homework, you're probably not going to progress a great deal in your Christian life because it requires a amount of effort. But once you understand effort in the biblical sense, once you've drawn near to God, once you've developed an intimate relationship where you have your own no-so, 
you come into this beautiful truth of, of Philippians 2.12 and 2.13. And that's what we're trying to transition the church in. To spiritually mother and father a church to understand experientially Philippians 2.12, 13, I hope that's the right verse. But 2.12, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds like effort to me, doesn't it? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But the very next verse is the beautiful solution. Verse 13 says, For it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. You've got to click over into that reality. Don't just look, get stuck on verse 12, work out your salvation, get all burned out trying and uh, struggling. If you're struggling, you're trying. Try. We even made the acronym TRY, T-R-Y. Temporarily resist yielding. <laughs> Don't try, trust, yield, surrender. And it's not comfortable. It's like getting Dennis the Menace to sit still in prayer. You have to wean that flesh from its authority and submit it to a higher authority. And I'll tell you what, from that place on, you're walking in an anointing that that is a walk in the spirit. It's a practicing the presence of God that's enjoyable and satisfying and rewarding. And it's easy once you get out of the way, right? Now, generally, uh, children uh, do not like the pressure from fathering component uh, of their society. If they accept it, they develop a good work ethic and internal motivation. I'm talking about even unsafe people. But mothering is a type of womb, special, allows the body to develop passively, but that's about all. The body did not come to the place of maturity inside the womb. It comes outside the womb. And the soul needs to develop cognitively, emotionally, and willfully. Now, Jesus mothered his disciples. I get a kick out of it. We've got we to get to the scripture of some of this. Uh, Jesus mothered them. They were with him day and night. He had endless conversations with them. He encouraged them. He reassured them. But even at high tide with the mothering, he said, how long am I going to be with you people? <laughs> you owe ye of little faith. So apparently there was a transition point. What did he do in the transition point? After successful mothering, after creating a safe environment, after building an intimate relationship with them, he said, uh, go. He sent them out, two by two. He sent them out. And you're going to be unpacked as you utilize what's already in you. I'm not going to do it for you. I'm sending you out in the power of the Spirit. And it's going to be a joint effort, a co-laboring you and the Spirit. Now, at school, a teacher communicates the idea She designed a series of tests, quizzes. That's actually a fathering principle because we want to see what your capacity is. Everybody, even, even with Jennifer, I've known uh, well above genius IQ, and other people I've dealt with that were uh, had genius IQs. I don't know why God sent me those people. Probably keep me in line. But <laughs> at least that's why he sent Jennifer. But... Uh, they all have strengths and weaknesses. The smartest person is still got their intelligence in areas. And God cares about the other areas. And you want those needs met righteously from him, not relying on yourself. If you're a head person, you've relied on your head most of your life and it got you out of trouble. But it can also get you in trouble as far as being a barrier between you and God. So... Um, fathering approach. His goal is to release or unpack the potential in a child. Uh, we, we saw this before that the um, mothering. Let me, let me cover mothering. If those, those of you are a note taker before we get into the serious ministry part here. Um, the mothering focus is on equality. Um, the focus is on immediately running and give attention to something. Right, and if they can't, if they're hindered, they will react. They they run immediately to be a caregiver. They believe the myth: uh, if you get too much mothering, 
You believe the myth that life must be kind and gentle and you must have many resources given. That's mothering. If it's carried too far, you expect that. You become dependent on others for provision, the right environment for them to succeed, feel that they are special without any achievement or character development. I'm special because I'm alive. And I believe that I automatically am entitled. I saw people with zero training that really believed that they should be managers, presidents, CEOs, but they never did anything. You know, you don't start there unless there was some kind of damage in the mothering concept. I don't know what happened, but they just were entitled to be the boss, but they were never an employee, never faithful in the little things, but expected to be bosses of big things. I, I, I don't get it. All right. But the uh, fathering aspect is focus on a differentiation of achievement, like understanding each child is different. Each child is in a particular place. I do that in, in this church. I know the strengths and weaknesses of a lot of people, but I'm going to try to, to point to the weaknesses to develop them and give you the tools to do it yourself even. Duh. And <laughs> at the same time, encourage the strengths and the progress that I see you make. Now, fathering is focused on future potential. God wants his children to go up from child to young man to fathers. No. Maturing requires fathering. Mothering alone is not enough. I think that's clear. Uh, receiving information. Knowing who we are is not the same as unpacking who we are. Um, and actually, the way to see if you're responding to fathering is do you have a testimony? Daily, weekly, monthly? Have you ever said, have you, can you testify that God did such and such in me? I had to deal with this, but now, God, I got the breakthrough and this happened. If you don't have a testimony of internal breakthrough, not works, because you can, you can, we're going to get into that. You can get into some type of substitute. All right, matter of fact, we, we need to go there right now. But no testimonies, no practice. Okay. Now, I've already told you that in in uh, uh, that there's important scriptures here that that uh, say everything. But I'd rather read First Thessalonians. Chapter 2, uh, in verses 1 to 14, you could read the whole context. I'm just going to read this to you. This is the Apostle Paul, and I think this is a beautiful statement of his ministry style. Um, remember, he already said, though you have 10,000 instructors, and in some translations say boy leaders, we shouldn't have young people raising young people, even in Bible schools. I've seen too much of that. There needs to be someone that's that's experienced successes and failures and learned from it. But anyway, here's the verse. In verse 7 it says, But we were gentle among you, just as a mother cherishes her own children. Now that's a man talking. We were gentle among you. And how? Just like a nursing mother cherishes her own children so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives. We, we poured ourselves into this relationship. We want to see the best for you. And you'd become dear to us. Now, later it says that, as you know, we exhorted, comforted, charged, which really means commissioned, sent you forth, commissioned every one of you as a father does his own children. So the mothering and the fathering aspects of equipping or parenting, spiritually parenting uh, the children was made clear that they needed both. If Paul knew that they needed both, we all need to know that they needed both. And my son Timothy, in whom I loved, and all through scriptures you can find father-son type relationship, but that's father-daughter too. And, and like I said, some of these principles can happen through a male or a female. It's a question of of equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. Now, uh, 
here's where we are. This is the more prophetic thing for Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries. Um, and Cliff, uh, Pastor Cliff, he's confirmed this word uh, to us a, a week or so ago, uh, that where we're at right now is we are mobilizing a people from Tuesdays where it was just Kingdom Life Church people coming together. They came together in a one accord and they became a voice, a corporate voice. And now recently God says, invite people to come and observe, participate. But I believe we can model something on Tuesdays about uh, sensitizing yourself to the spirit, getting your spiritual senses trained. By that I mean, even Dave Walters, he used to teach our children uh, the prophetic and, and a walk in the spirit. And he'd come to my first church in Pennsylvania, and he, he would tell the kids, I have to tell adults this, all inner knowings, by the way, this is your heart, not here, all inner knowings, the door of the heart, inner knowings, perceptions, are either seeing, hearing, or touching. See, hear, touch. And on Tuesdays, we cultivate that. Some would just call it soaking because there's music playing, there's no teaching. But the music playing and soaking, it's taking soaking to a whole nother degree. It's soaking with a specificity of training and equipping people who can't normally sit still to sit still until they've heard something. And that's where God discipled me antsy. I wanted to walk and pray. I wanted to talk and pray. And I didn't want to sit still and pray because my flesh would scream to do something. And God said, Isaiah 50. I'm going to give you, Dennis, the tongue of a disciple, and you're going to be able to give a word in season to them that are weary. Morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. And the first thing he did was make me sit still and say, like a weaned child with its mother, uh, you, you didn't meet me in the morning until you quieted your flesh. Until you quiet your flesh. And you'll know when it changes. You'll know that all of a sudden, Time even kind of passes without you being aware of it because you've entered into the authority of your spirit of Jesus in you over your mind, will, and emotions. Don't annihilate the mind, will, and emotions, but you quiet them down. Okay, so that's on Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, it's equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And to do the work of the ministry, it's no teaching except what's necessary for clarification, but it's strictly just admit, totally just ministering to people on Thursdays. And we've got people coming from all different places to do just that. Okay, so um, train up a child in the way she'll go and whatever wisdom, love, nurture, and discipline is needed. It presupposes that the parents are emotionally mature, but the good news is we've got a solution, whether they are or they aren't. And what we did, one of the tests we do on a Thursday is, on a scale of one to 10, how safe and secure, the mothering, how safe and secure did you feel on, a, on the basis of a scale of one to 10? And if it's anything less than a 10, then even if it's a 10, you need to have that need met righteously, not by flesh and blood. Because there's people that actually have had 10 parents that were wonderful and they're depending more on them than God. Now, it goes on to say that um, where we're at, besides the Tuesday and the Thursday, is now it's building momentum. And what we're exhibiting on Tuesday is a team. We're calling it a one accord. Because the voice of the Lord is coming through a corporate people. It's not just coming from the pulpit here. It's coming through a corporate people. And when there's a similarity, it's something that I can't and you can't have by yourself. And that's a corporate anointing. And there's something in the corporate anointing that is beneficial. There's a blessing in the cluster, is the way the Old Testament used to say it. And that's why we even said the cluster of grapes is what we're working toward as far as even a congregation. You can be the most anointed little grape, you know, by yourself, but you can't have a corporate anointing. You can't be a cluster by yourself. And, and I'm seeing now that some of the major prophetic leaders now, they don't use the word church no more. And it's smart because it's been used wrong. 
People would be individuals saying, I am the church. No, you're not. You're, you can be part of the ecclesia. You cannot be a church by yourself. You can only be part of the church. And so the ecclesia is like a cluster. How much more beautiful would it be if I held up a transparency here and you saw a round circle? I'd probably have to tell you that that was a grape. And it could be an anointed grape, but you wouldn't know it was a. But if I held up a silhouette of a cluster on the stem, you'd say, oh, that looks like a cluster of grapes. God is looking for a life message that's going to depict his character and his nature more clearly than any one person can do it. We can all learn from one another, we all have various gifts, but God says, watch what I will do. And that the word that he gave us two years now, and he says, watch what I will do because I'm putting something together. Other people may not have this layout. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just trying to be obedient to God. But our Tuesdays are significantly different than our Thursdays and our Sundays. Now, all right, you ready for ministry? Okay, I think I have enough time left. Legitimate needs. Love. Is that legitimate? Affection. Attention, affirmation, acceptance. I did a lot of A words here, make it easy. Approval, belonging, security. You got to watch the YouTube if you're going to write these down. Identity, value, worth. Purpose, peace. You get the idea, though. Hmm? Are those legitimate? Yes. God made us to have those, but you can either get those needs met righteously or unrighteously. And trust me, you don't have any vacuums in your life. If it's not being met righteously, you have a substitute. We need to talk about that. Because ideally, parents, rear your children in the training and discipline and the counsel and admonition of the Lord. And that usually follows three phases. In Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, there's first of all, you give them instruction. But what do you do when instruction doesn't work? Well, then you have to administer correction. Well, what happens when the, they don't heed the correction? There needs to be a consequence. That's healthy nurture. That's loving your child. There's all kinds of crazy theories out there now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough now that... I grew up before many of these theories were there, so I'm probably a hard sell, you know. Because I've seen the value of what the Bible called discipline. I, I remembered when my son Jason growing up, he would look at my younger son, 10 years difference in their part, and he'd misbehave, and he'd go, oh, I'm not going to do that. Why doesn't he see that he's only going to get in trouble? So, you know, it's like, I had a friend, too. He became an eye surgeon, and he was younger than his sister, and his sister got slapped all the time by the father. I mean, she had a mouth that wouldn't, no matter what he said, to stop, she wouldn't stop. He'd slap her. And he'd go, when I grow up, I'm not going to talk back. <laughs> you can learn from other people's mistakes, you know, or you can repeat them. I thought... For an intelligent man, he had, a, he had a lot going for him. Ideally, parents should give the children a good emotional foundation. And it's designed to be generational. In other words, God really wanted you to pass it on generation to generation. And what we're seeing on Thursday night, a lot of people getting healed of stuff that was passed on generation after generation. All right? It wasn't all blessing. <laughs> so uh, when... This is lacking in childhood. Emotional neediness will push them. It'll push them and people away from them. You know, you've all experienced someone that's clingy. And you feel like going like this. Because they're trying to get the need met unrighteously. They're trying to pull on flesh to get that need met. So uh, it's extremely damaging. People choose a negative way of, of searching for that need to be met. Now, 
substitutes. It's not a sin to want love, but it's wrong to meet that need in a sinful way. All right, this is where we're going with that. Uh, substitutes. And here's, here's the, the, the scriptural context that is as valid today as it was then. Jeremiah 2.13. This is something every Christian ought to look at and do their homework on it. There's that homework thing. There's that fathering. Don't, boy, golly, I go to church on Sunday. I'm there for an hour, and he gives me homework. Uh, it's like i got to live my Christian life other than on Sunday. Um, what do they expect? My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain. Now, look where I'm pointing. They have forsaken me, the fountain. You know, even the fear of the Lord comes from a Hebrew word, yara, which means to flow from the source. Jesus said, if anyone, and Bill Morford was in our church in Columbia, and he wrote the One New Man Bible, and he said what's missing is that word continually. We, we kind of miss it in the English language. But he did John 7, 38, 37, 38, and said, if you will continually come to me and drink, I will continually pour out my living water out of your belly. If you will continually come to me and drink, I will continually pour out of your belly rivers of living water, continually. That is meant to be a relationship, not a one-time happening, okay? So continually pour out your blessing. Now, here's the test. And if you can't do it here, come Thursday, and we'll minister to you personally on this. Ask yourself, what did your parent this is the most important part, so this you want to take note on. <laughs> what do you wish your parents or caregiver could have given you in terms of emotional needs or support as a child? What do you wish they would have given you? Even if they gave it to you marginally, what would you wish that they would have given you more of? Because we're going to teach you how to get that need met righteously. And you're not going to be walking around with vacuums where you found substitutes, all right? What do you feel was lacking? What were, the term of this is an unmet need. Your answer should show what unmet need that is actually, believe it or not, holding you back in your relationships. The unmet need will become a point of contention in relationships. And more than likely, you will blame them. When most of the people that get onto the blame game, in every case, it's they're the problem because they're failing to respond in a redemptive way toward a perpetrator. Blame is easy, but that's before Jesus, really. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people. And anybody that talks about anybody over and over and over again, you are the problem. You are the problem. It's like Saul Alinsky tactic. Do you know that's the way they would go after people? That's demonic. That's the only reason John Wesley would kick someone out of his church, was slandering. All it's doing, it's revealing in you your inability to respond redemptively. There's something in you. Beware lest a bitter root, Hebrews 12, 15. Beware lest a bitter root spring up causes you trouble and defiles others. You can push somebody to sin against you. That's Yeah, that's their sin. But do you want that in your repertoire before God? Is that I pushed people to sin? No. My people have committed two errors. Now, here's the part that I want to get to that I feel is important. If you're ever going to grow up as a Christian and not stay a baby forever, and that is everybody can quote that scripture, but I ask them, what do you mean by that? Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. And if you ask the typical Christian, even a mature Christian, what does that mean? They will give... Uh, Roof over my head, a job, income, food, clothing. Are those legitimate needs? Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about in the scripture. That is not, my God shall supply all of my need. Your legitimate needs are for affection, approval, attention, security, that is a currency of heaven that is far superior than money and food. 
It's the currency of living life on planet Earth in a world that is not fair. That fairness doctrine has to die in a believer. It's how do I respond in light of, that is the maturity that God's looking for, full stature. You see how we get the title of our ministry in there all the time? It's because I don't have any other, I don't have any other mission. I have a mandate to teach it and then demonstrate how to accomplish it. So if you're faint at heart, don't listen to me. You will faint. <laughs> and don't try in the flesh to do it. You can't do it apart from him. You can do nothing. The independent you can't do nothing. But I, it is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. If you can switch over into that, you will find a productivity and a character development that will surprise you. A testimony. Regularly. Without a testimony, you could be growing in Bible knowledge, but not experiencing Jesus in the real world. What did the Mishnah say? That your natural father can bring you into this world, but your mentors and your spiritual fathers can teach you how to live in the spirit world and the world to come. You need training in that regardless of what kind of upbringing you had. Now, identifying substitutes. You know what the legitimate needs are, right? That's pretty self-explanatory. Worth, purpose, peace, security, acceptance. Here's some substitutes. And they're not sinful by themselves. That's, that's the part that we really want to drive home. Food. Overeating. <laughs> I watch Hallmark, and guess what? When the women are upset, they go eat a half a gallon ice cream. That would be a cistern, a substitute. The men, they go beat up somebody or get drunk. <laughs> I'm just talking Hallmark, okay? And then they're sorry and everything works out within, uh, if it's an hour program at the 40 minute mark, everything, somehow they dramatically have a life transformation without God and they're wonderful. <laughs> and everything's happy for them ever and ever, okay? All right, well, whatever. But shopping, workaholic, sex, entertainment, drugs, drinking, family, children. I've seen idolatry, the idolatry of family compensate for the hurt that was on the inside of somebody who didn't really have family. They just did strict parents become lenient children. Lenient parents, then the kids will say, it was too easy. Actually, a little discipline would have showed me they love me. You know, doing the opposite is not a correction. It requires an internal transformation of a righteous, a righteous transformation. Legitimate needs. Education. I prayed uh, with Jennifer when we first got married. Her dad Actually, education is a good thing. He had it in an idolatrous position, didn't he? I mean, it was scary. It was like he made a god out of education. And education is not a bad thing. You can make an idol out of anything, but it would be a substitute for something. Find out what the root is to that. Find out what is, what is the legitimate need, what is the substitute, and... Where did that get started in my life? I want to make the exchange. And uh, I'm going to give the example of my dad again. Uh, my dad was illegitimate, and my grandfather despised him, even though he had other brothers and sisters. My grandfather loved the other brothers and sisters, but despised my dad because he was the epitome of his sin. Non-Christian, but still. That was the way he looked at my dad. My dad said he grew up invisible. I was born two sisters. Guess what? I was the invisible one. That's generational. But he couldn't give me something he never got, right? He never got attention. He was invisible. He was there, but he wasn't there. He would tell, he'd say, Dad, I, I went to night school and I got my degree. You know, Your sister made a jello salad yesterday that was really good. An inability to acknowledge, but it was his, his blindness that did it. His own sin did it. Well, then I'm born, and 
I go through the same thing. I'm invisible. And I get saved. And God's ministering to me in a school of the Spirit. And he says, to release forgiveness to my dad. He couldn't give me something he didn't have anyway, but not logically. But just do it because that's the right thing to do. I release forgiveness. And some of you may have to do this. I release forgiveness to my dad. And I can remember specifically, it was for being invisible, but the one time that was probably a root issue was my sister contracted uh, spinal meningitis, and she was in the hospital. Me and my other sister were there, and my dad was weeping over my sister, and he said, why couldn't it have been him? You think I would feel rejected? You think that would feel rejected? But I had that my whole life, so that was not a new thing. And it was for him, it was probably a slip of the tongue, but he meant it. Well, I had God tell me as a baby Christian to release forgiveness to my dad, but here's the part that's important. If you're going to get your need met righteously, you've got to release any demands or expectations you have on them of changing them and making them do something. Because it's not rational, but sometimes you want them to do something that they're not even capable of doing anyway. You're the one that's irrational demanding it from somebody. So I release forgiveness to him, and I release any demand or expectation he would ever get. And I heard God say, good, now I'll give it to you. And I wasn't even expecting it. And he said, Dennis, and these are the scriptures that I feel an anointing just talking about because they're so real to me. They're written. He says, Dennis, my thoughts are continually toward you. Your, your name is graven on a tablet of my, uh, uh, my hand and on my heart. Uh, my thoughts are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. I am accepted in the beloved. When I said that word accepted, I saw something go in and stamp approval, attention on the inside of me that nobody could erase, not even me. That's getting the need met righteously. But you cannot get a need met righteously if you won't forgive perpetrators and release the demands and expectations you put on other people to give it. I've seen people, their parents were dead and they're still demanding that they get the love. It's not rational. You're going to get that need met righteously or unrighteously. No. I want you to identify uh, the substitutes. Money, religion, fantasy, hobbies willpower, which means trying harder. Trying harder could be a substitute for the real relationship with God of sitting still like I had to and what we're doing on Tuesdays. He would tell me through Isaiah 50 when he was discipling me, I'm going to give you the tongue of a learned, but Dennis, I wanted to talk. I had 30 million questions to ask God, and he says, Dennis, you don't have anything to say until you've heard something. Oh. Well, I like talking. <laughs> mm -hmm, nah, we know. But if you, were, if you were in school, who does the talking, you or the teacher? Oh, well, yeah, the teacher. He goes, I'm your teacher. And I'm going to awaken your ear morning by morning to give you an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, which, which actually means I'm going to make you a listener first. Oh, man, that's like dying, my flesh. And he goes, yeah, that's what I want. I want that flesh to die. All right, so here's a way to identify some substitutes anyway, and I hope this will help. When you are upset, what do you do to make yourself feel better? It's a simple enough question. I know on Hallmark they eat ice cream. I don't know if that's yours. Or they punch somebody. Or, or when the person wants to explain, they go, no. That's, that's a good Hallmark strategy, right? Right when the person says, well, what's wrong? What happened? They give them the silent treatment. Yeah person who isolates themselves seeking their own desires, not the will of God. 
Anyone that isolates himself, they only rely on their own insight. All right. I wish... Okay, let's, let's identify... I wish they had told me they loved me. I wish they had spent more time with me. We did this one already, okay? Let's write that down, and, and Thursday, we're going to get that need met righteously because more than likely you've got to substitute. Somehow you've compensated for it. And it could be money, social status, religion. You'd be surprised at things that we replace legitimate needs with as far as a substitute. They could look harmless. Now, an unmet emotional need. In an attitude of prayer, ask the Lord to show you any unmet emotional needs. Love, attention, approval, security. That's causing you current relational problems for you. Now, by relational problems, we don't get into the blame game that it's the other person all the time. It's how safe are you in God to respond appropriately to a perpetrator? instead of talking about them all the time. And that's a key sign. And there's a strategy with the Saul Alinsky thing that I've seen in the church that's prevalent, is you pick on this one person and over and over and you hear about the same one person and then it stops, like they really deal with it. They immediately have another target that they can talk about over and over and over. That means it really didn't get resolved in you. You just changed targets. John Wesley, that was the only reason he would kick someone out of the church, was slandering like that. So you have something that somebody's done you wrong, what's the redemptive solution? Bless them that curse you, pray for them. The Diddy case says, fast and pray for your enemy. Complaining about them only poisons you. So look back and say, well, I got the victory over forgiving so-and-so. Yeah, well, who are you picking on now? You didn't get healed. You just changed, polarized. Isn't that the term they use? Find a new victim, polarize it, victimize it. And don't come against an institution. Come against a person. It's more damaging to come against a person than an institution. Now, identifying relational walls. Now, this would be, Jennifer would say, as a, as a psychologist, counter-dependency. And we'd, I saw a need for this on Thursday. <clears throat> Identifying walls. When I married Jennifer, the first time I prayed with her, that was the first thing I had to do. Is what she did. She'd been widowed for how many years? Five years. She was widowed for five years. So she, like a lot of Christian women would do, without knowing it, she put up a carnal wall to keep her from men. But that's what I've watched mature Christians do. They put up a wall. That's carnal, though. It doesn't really work. But, well, it can work if you want to hold it up all day and be stressed by it and be constantly on the prowl, suspicion, and everything to make sure your wall is up and you're protected. A lot of times you gave in and took Allison, who was a pretty wild uh, young lady <laughs> when she was little, and she put Allison in front. That deterred some men. Right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, all of her friends were afraid that Allison was going to deter me from marrying Jennifer. She's got, like her mother, her daughter's got genius IQ, and she lets everybody know how smart she is. She just got her PhD in molecular biology. But anyway, uh, she was sitting in her chair like this, and here my mom's bringing this man around now, and she's going... <sighs> I'm bored. Bored is a sign of intelligence, you know. <laughs> and I said, no, it means you're not using all that God gave you. <laughs> and all of her friends in unison went, oh, he'll be all right. <laughs> they were all afraid I couldn't survive Allison. And then when we left Georgia to come up here, she had her feet up in the back seat going, thank God a man's finally getting us out of this one-horse town. So, went to school with her, 
And I loved it because she, I liked, uh, she was in a Christian school and I could go to eat lunch with her and we, we would discern her friends. Who's a Christian? Who's there because their parents made them go? You know, oh, that one over there. That doesn't feel good. Oh, yeah, she's a witch. La, 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 la. <laughs> so, but she got, she got fathered and she liked it. Of course, I had to pray a lot of healing over her mother. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like the way it would go, though? My mother wouldn't let me do this. My mother and I said, well, I wouldn't either. Well, that's okay. It, it was okay if I laid the law down, but not her mother. All right. All right. So counterdependency is, is what hurt you during your life? What do you feel was hurtful or harmful? Uh, I wish they hadn't humiliated me when, this is a for instance, uh, when I had trouble learning to ride my bike. I wish they hadn't punished me by calling me names or hitting me. Uh, what you would call counter-dependency is actually wishing, what do you wish wouldn't have happened? What would you have liked to have eliminated it? So you, there's a wishing what I could have, what they could have done, and what what I wish they wouldn't have done. Either way, you're going to get some good healing. Doesn't matter which one of those you pick. All right. Most social and interpersonal problems come from using substitutes to deal with unmet. You would be surprised how friends, conflicts in church, business, people just bouncing off their own unmet needs and you're, you might be messing with their substitute. <laughs> and like they said, if somebody's pushing your button, you have the button. And maybe even your mother installed it, I don't know. <laughs> but somehow, if <laughs> you've got a button, you're pushing. So, Substitute to meet needs unrighteously. Television, vacations, entertainment, sports, fantasy. If you see something that's not sin in and of itself, but you would have a real difficult time letting it go, I would find out where that's coming from. I saw people that habitually had to have a vacation. Habitually. I'm saying there's a need that's not being met there. Unhealthy relationships. They go into one bad relationship after another, after another, after another. Getting fired over and over and over again. Quitting over and over and over again. There's an unmet emotional need. If you, can, if you have the ability to do this on your own, fine. Otherwise, bring it Thursday and we're going to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Unmet needs. Things that were done that you wished wouldn't have been done and the things that you wished would have happened and didn't. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit, show me the substitute, because if you can get freed up from the substitute, you can get that need met righteously, then even the substitute will be more enjoyable. Does that make sense? I mean, if it's sports, if that's what you do to escape relationship, and it's sports, but if you dealt with it, that need met righteously, you could actually enjoy sports without the pressure. When I prayed for that one little girl who was in a soul tie, and it still was impressed me the way she determined it. She said, Dennis, you taught me how to forgive, and I can do that, but it's like, if, I, I know it's a bad relationship for me, but I don't know how... And I said, well, we prayed it through. I taught her how to break this whole time, make it short. And she says, I don't feel like I have to hate him, but I don't feel the pull anymore. That's freedom. That's freedom. I don't feel the pull, but I don't have to push away and hate. Because if it was a love-hate thing, was the only way she knew how to deal with an unhealthy attachment. So, Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you who began a good work are going to continue it. And Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.